Welcome. Today I'll be interviewing Mr. Alexander Corbet. He is a substantive analyst of the Special Operations and Intelligence at the SECDEF Group. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today, Alex. Um, it's a pleasure having you. I'd like to start off by asking you a few questions pertaining to your expertise. In terms of Russia's intervention in Syria, what would you say are some of Russia's main goals in intervening in Syria? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a variety of factors and reasons for why Russia is intervening in the conflict in Syria. Um, first, the domestic factors in Russia. You see that the economy in Russia is not doing that well right now. Uh, the price of oil is quite low. Um, in addition to the fact that Russia has been under sanctions for their intervention in Ukraine um, for, for well over a year now at this point. So Putin is, is primarily trying to pander to a domestic audience, trying to get their views off of what's happening in Ukraine and also kind of the, uh, the economic burden at home. Uh, in addition, in the international level, we've seen uh, the United States try to pivot away um, from the Middle East and towards Asia as well. Um, that's provided Putin with an opportunity to uh, to raise kind of Russians involved, Russia's involvement in the Middle East at this point um, at, at the expense of the U.S. This is both a triumph for him domestically and an attempt for him to, to uh, embolden Russia on the international stage. Uh, in addition, um, what we've seen is basically the Assad regime uh, lose uh, special parts of, of Syria, definitely uh, crucial parts to, to his regime over the last few months. Uh, and Russia is coming in to help a, uh, help a patron of theirs, uh, sorry, help a client of theirs um, at a time when it's facing a very, very dire situation in the country right now. So there's a variety of factors, you know, like I said, domestically, economically, internationally, in an attempt to, uh, to raise Russia's profile in the Middle East, and uh, domestic for Syria in terms of protecting a client that's under threat. What do you think will be NATO's next move and response in terms of uh, Russia's intervention and Russian flybys over Turkey? Mm -hmm. In addition to flybys over Turkey, we've seen some uh, some locking on to, to French planes inside Syria as well too. Uh, we've also seen some very uh, close flybys, whether it's towards uh, U.S. drones or other coalition aircraft as well. Um, what we've seen so far is some very strong statements uh, from NATO uh, in regards to protecting their uh, their uh, their member state, Turkey, um, and into in regards to you know looking at these these blatant violations of, of Turkish airspace and, and the safety of their pilots as well. Uh, from the U.S., we've seen them sign a, a memorandum of understanding between them and, and Russia to ensure that the uh, the planes don't come close and that there's going to be sharing at least of intelligence of flight patterns so you know hostilities hostilities won't happen or mistakes won't happen in the air as well. Uh, what I see happening from NATO is this continued response uh, with regards to protecting uh, Turkish air sovereignty. Uh, in addition to that, I don't see any concrete efforts on the ground with inside Syria. Syria is quite the quagmire at this point. Uh, we've seen you know, the U.S. training and equip program fail. Um, we've seen a uh, very hesitant West try to get involved in, into the conflict as well. So I don't see any strong military um, actions taking place, but I do see a lot of diplomatic back and forth to ensure that this doesn't escalate any further. In terms of security terrorism and issues that are ongoing in today's world, mm -hmm. what would you say are the biggest threats in terms of terrorism in Canada, and how does that compare to the threats received in the United States of America? Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting. I think the uh, it's you know we had the uh, the first year anniversary of the tax of Parliament uh, yesterday. I was there in Ottawa. I, I saw it happen. The mood's definitely changed here in Canada. I think we we had thought that because of our our, our policies on multiculturalism, our acceptance that we would be uh, be immune to such attacks. Uh, we've seen that's, that's not the case. It's very easy in this day and age for someone to get radicalized on the internet. Um, it's easy for someone to get radicalized, whether it's in a community center, a church, a mosque, anywhere else. And we've, we've seen attacks here in Canada of different stripes, um, which brings us closer to kind of the, the domestic uh, situation in the United States or since 9-11. Um, I would compare and say that, of course, in the United States, the, the issue is a lot worse, just given the fact that the, uh, the U.S. is the, the largest global player, uh, very involved in the Middle East. Um, for Canada, uh, I would say that it continues to be um, ISIS-inspired terrorism uh, in Canada, in addition to, to white supremacy um, out uh, west in the country as well. That, that's definitely created some issues, and as we've seen with the Oklahoma bombing in the United States, it can definitely turn into a, to a large and massive-scale terrorist attack. Um, at this point right now, I would, I would say continued, it would be continued threat from ISIS, a uh, possible continued threat from Al-Qaeda. And uh, one of the things that kind of gets overlooked in the Canadian sphere as well is, is Canada has, uh, has members of different groups, whether it's Hezbollah, 
or people who have been tied to Al-Qaeda that are actually funding these groups, trying to get recruitment as well, too. So while it's not blatant attacks, there's also the, the, the need to cut off funding and, and cut off influence and recruitment. And then, of course, the foreign fighter phenomenon as well, too. I mean, we have basically around 100 foreign fighters that have left from Canada. By comparison, there's only 150 that have left from the United States. And if you compare the population, the U.S. is about 10 times our size. So this is definitely a, an issue. Uh, and I think that all uh, political parties in the election were, were kind of dealing, asking how to deal with it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see moving forward with this, this liberal majority win, how they tackle uh, you know, Bill C-51, uh, and how they continue to deal with, ter with uh, the threat of terrorism in the country. In terms of social media, how would you say social media has portrayed the civil war in Syria? Mm -hmm. um, it's quite interesting. I mean, this is Syria is known as you know, the, the most social mediated war. And it's really the first big major civil conflict that we've had in, in, the, in the era of social media. You know, Twitter is quite young, Facebook is quite young, Instagram, Tumblr even has been used. Um, it provides both a view of the atrocities that are happening on the ground it allows activists to, uh, to, to you know, set up their phones, set up their cameras, and, and show the world what's happening. And it, of course, it, it, it creates a lot, of, uh, a lot of international press and a lot of sympathy for the, for the people within Syria as well, too. And of course, we've seen similar effects in, in Ukraine as well. Um, in addition to, to kind of the activist role, we see both sides of the, of the conflict in, in both Ukraine and in Syria as well, to take advantage of, of uh, social media. Whether it's in terms of intimidating uh, their enemies, like ISIS has done with the release of a variety of videos, whether it's showing executions or them overrunning uh, different regime or rebel-held areas. Uh, in addition to that, it's also uh, being used to, to uh, announce the creation of different rebel groups and alliances as well. It helps analysts like me basically track the progression of the conflict as well. Um, it, you track foreign involvement. Uh, within the first couple days of the Russian intervention in Syria, rebel groups were posting up videos of planes flying overhead that were obviously Russian transport planes going to uh, going to the coast. Uh, in addition to that, it also allows uh, viewers and analysts and, and those who are interested in the conflict to, to understand what sort of weaponry is being used. And this has allowed us to basically trace back uh, foreign funding to different groups, whether it's rebel groups using anti-tank weapons that have been uh, basically uh, created by the U.S and then sent through by Saudi and Qatar, and then on the other side with, uh, with the Assad regime, um, Iranian and Russian weapons coming into the conflict as well. What advice would you be able to provide to the students interested in pursuing a career in international relations and mm -hmm. affairs? A lot of our viewers are very passionate about world issues and concerns pertaining to events and things that are happening around the world. So I, I would love your expertise in terms of advice for the youth listening and for our viewers who would love to know what steps they should take next. Definitely. Um, I'd probably address the, the Canadians who are interested in the, in the same issues as well too. Um, because it's, it's different outside. In the United States there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of bursaries, a lot of study programs that you can either go abroad. Europe is the same way as, as well too. Um, in Canada, I would say that a master's program is probably the minimum for getting into kind of this sort of work. Uh, but that's not where it stops. Second language is, of course, important. I'm in the process right now of learning, uh, learning Arabic, um, and that's something that I would have actually done if I was going to do it over again. I would have, I would have learned a second language while I was in school and, and not after. Um, that said, I have a little bit of free time now to kind of do that on my own. Uh, in addition to that, I would say continue learning. A lot of people finish their masters or finish their education and they say, okay, I'm done, I'm just going to get into the practice as well too. But these things are constantly changing and, and you know, th new theories are popping up every day. Uh, and I think online programs like, uh, you know, what Coursera provides or various universities in the United States and Europe provide as well too is, is good with keeping up with that. Read the news on a daily basis, that's something I do every, every morning. Um, take advantage of social media as well too in terms of looking for opportunities, in terms of looking for news. Uh, and I would also say join, join an organization like the NATO Council. Canada. I mean, I'm definitely in the position I am today because I had the opportunity to, to intern here and then work here as well too. And that's what I would say. So you keep keep uh, keep your options open. Uh, do a lot of research. Um, figure out what school works for you. Uh, and then after that, you know, figure out what organizations, both domestically and internationally, that you want to work for. And, and kind of seek out people that have done that before. Um, figure out how they've gotten there, either through looking at LinkedIn, you know, asking someone for coffee or Skype uh, chat, and that's probably the best way to move forward from, from you know, being, a, being an undergraduate student to, to getting into a profession that you're, you're passionate about.
Certainly, I think it's crucial for today's youth to be actively involved and engaged. Um, like you mentioned, education is very important. I myself have a bachelor's in legal studies from the University of Waterloo, a master's in public service from the University of Waterloo as well. And then after that, I attended Harvard Law School's executive education program, um, so where I had, I, you know what? It's, uh, it's definitely good to have that advice because even though I'm, I, I completed all of those degrees, I'm still in the process of completing my LLB through University of London's international program. Okay. So it's an ongoing process. For sure. Education is power, and you're never too old to continue learning. Um, you learn something new every day. Exactly. So it's a lifelong process. Yes. <laughs> um, did you want to provide any additional advice to people who might? want to pursue the profession but are concerned about certain challenges, mm -hmm. uh, what would be the best way to overcome obstacles in order to persevere in this industry? I, I was about to say it's perseverance as well too. Um, and, and again, that, that has to do with kind of the, the, the fact that Canada is a smaller country. I, I would say look at overseas opportunities. Um, if you can't afford those overseas opportunities, because they're, they're quite expensive as well too, look into kind of what programs you can go into, look into bursaries, look into grants, uh, look how to get those. At, at a very early stage, I would say for, for undergraduate students, that's definitely the, the most important thing. Figure out a plan. If you want to do a graduate degree after, and you know you still need to take funding, but you want to be able to get the, the, that international experience that goes along with it, that language experience, or, or you kind of don't know how to pay in addition to taking out, uh, taking out loans. Look at those opportunities and work hard and strive to, to get the grades and, and the experience that, that are required. Absolutely. Alex Corbet, I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.